And that's after we go live to Rochester Cathedral to celebrate the Easter Eucharist. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Good morning and a happy Easter from a cathedral which has seen nearly 1400 years of Christian worship in a city that I hold in great affection because my dad was born here in Rochester and grew up here. He did his courting here with my mum and she was confirmed in this great cathedral. So it obviously is a great family favourite for us. And there are many families here this morning who've come to share this joyful celebration of the resurrection. A celebration that began at the rather less than joyful hour of 5 a.m. this morning with an Easter vigil. Let us pray. Eternal God, you made this most holy night to shine with the brightness of your one and true light. Set us aflame with the fire of your love and bring us to the radiance of your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What exactly is a vigil? Well, I think a vigil is a time of preparation for something important, um, a way of preparing yourself for a major event that's coming towards you. The first Christians took it very literally. You know, the Lord says, stay awake, and they used to stay awake all through the night on days when they thought it was likely the Lord would come. And Easter was one of those days when they thought he might return. So what does it mean for people to take part in a vigil like this today? I think it's still a time of preparation for us. Um, we're getting ready for a big feast, the, the annual memory of Christ's death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Day all comes together on this night. And uh, we, we, do, we do symbolic acts. We celebrate the resurrection like this. We start outside the church by striking fire from a rock as Christ came out of the earth. So we start with that sort of elemental substance of the earth below us, Christ bursting out of the tomb. With that fire, we light a, we light a fire which blazes up in front of us as Christ burst out. Uh, from the fire, we then light the Paschal candle, the Easter candle, which is a huge candle, which now symbolizes Christ in our midst. And that then leads us into church, into the church which is completely dark, people falling over the steps and all the rest of it. He leads us on into the church. Um, we then settle down and we read the scriptures about our creation, about how we fell from grace, about how God rescued his people over and over again, about how he continually promises to be with them and still does promise to be with us. Then we move on from that and we greet new Christians into the church on this night. It was originally the only night you could be baptized. And uh, we baptize people tonight, and we confirm them, and then we take them on into the Eucharist, into communion, for, the, for them the first time. I'm going to be one of the two to be baptized, and I'm also going to join the others to be confirmed. The reason that I'm having both done at the same time is because my parents decided that I should choose if I wanted to be baptized, so they didn't baptize me when I was young. It's a very significant day, isn't it, to take on such commitment? Yes, it is, because it's Easter Day and it signifies new life, new hope and a new future. Holly, I baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What made you decide that you wanted to be confirmed? Well, um, just over a year ago, one of my friends died and Christ gave me comfort through his words and through his prayers. And so I decided that I wanted to become a real Christian. What difference do you think this is going to make to you from now on? It's going to give me an extra friend, an extra person to turn to. It's going to mean I have more people that I can speak to. And obviously it's going to mean that God is there for me whenever I need him. And I'm also there for other people. So this Easter has a very special meaning for you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. This is going to be one Easter that I'm definitely going to remember. Confirm, O Lord, your servant Holly, with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The seal of the Spirit, the gift of the Father. Amen. 
Well, as you can see, that was a very moving occasion, if rather bleary-eyed, because, of course, everyone had missed an hour's sleep last night. But let's join everyone waiting for us now in the cathedral, including the Bishop of Rochester, the Right Reverend Dr. Michael Nazir Ali, on this most important day in the Christian calendar, because Jesus Christ is risen today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death, to make all things new in him, grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honor, glory and might, now and in all eternity. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who opened a way in the sea and a path through mighty waters, who drew on chariot and horse to their destruction a whole army, men of valor. There they lay, never to rise again. They were crushed, snuffed out like a wick, Cease to dwell on days gone by and to brood over past history. Here and now, I will do a new thing. This moment, it will break from the bud. Can you not perceive it? I will make a way even through the wilderness and paths in the barren desert. The wild beasts shall do me honor. The wolf and the ostrich, for I will provide water in the wilderness and rivers in the barren desert where my people may drink. I have formed this people for myself and they shall proclaim my praises. Thus it is written. We sing the hymn, Ye Choirs of New Jerusalem.
a reading from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. If this is what we proclaim, that Christ was raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection, then Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, then our gospel is null and void, and so is your faith. And we turn out to be lying witnesses for God, because we bore witness that he raised Christ to life, whereas if the dead are not raised, he did not raise him. For if the dead are not raised, it follows that Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, your faith has nothing in it, and you are still in your old state of sin. It follows also that those who have died within Christ's fellowship are utterly lost. If it is for this life only that Christ has given us hope, we of all men are most to be pitied. But the truth is, Christ was raised to life, the firstfruits of the harvest of the dead. Thus it is written, we sing the hymn, Love's Redeeming Work is Done. <laughs> reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. The Sabbath was over, and it was about daybreak on Sunday, when Mary of Magdala and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came to the stone and rolled it away, and sat himself down on it. His face shone like lightning, his garments were white as snow. At the sight of him the guards shook with fear, and lay like the dead. The angel then addressed the women. You, he said, have nothing to fear. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised again, as he said he would be. 
come and see the place where he was laid, and then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead and is going on before you into Galilee. There you will see him. This is what I have to tell you. They hurried away from the tomb in awe and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus was there in their path. He gave them his greeting, and they came up and clasped his feet, falling prostrate before him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brothers that they are to leave for Galilee. They will see me there. This is the Gospel of Christ. Cleanse my lips, O Lord, as you cleanse the lips of your prophet Isaiah with a burning coal, that I might worthily preach your holy gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus' life on earth ended in apparent failure on Good Friday. In his television series, The Lives of Jesus, Mark Tully portrays in graphic detail the extent of that failure. What had begun as a promising movement for spiritual and social renewal had foundered on the determined opposition of religious and political vested interests. The manifesto of sweeping change that Jesus had announced in his first sermon at Nazareth had begun to be fulfilled in his ministry of teaching, healing, and feeding. It was now overtaken by the disaster of his arrest, trial, and execution. As usual, it was the powerful who had won. But if the evidence is read in this way, there is something that sticks out like a sore thumb. Jesus had been executed in public, and the confused, frightened, and demoralized disciples, except for some women, had all fled. Another revolution seems to have come to an end. How then, asked Mark Tully, do we account for the church? Within a few, few years of Calvary, it is a fact of history that the Christian movement, far from dying out, was spreading like wildfire throughout the Roman Empire and beyond it. It is this awkward fact which has led Mark Tully to acknowledge that the disciples, cowed and scared as they were, had a dramatic encounter with Jesus, their master, who had died but was now risen. This encounter changed every aspect of their lives. Far from leaving them frightened and scattered, it welded them together into a powerful and world-changing force. Whether we like it or not, all of us live with the consequences of that first Easter. The Gospels do not tell us how the resurrection occurred. They point us only to the signs that it had occurred. All four tell us that it was the women who had stayed at the foot of the cross, who first saw the empty tomb and received news of the resurrection. They were the ones sent to tell the disciples of the empty tomb and the risen Lord. The empty tomb is significant because without it, stories about the resurrection would never have arisen. If they had arisen, they would have been scotched by escorting their authors to the tomb 
and to the body. Of course, the tomb is not significant in itself. It becomes significant when we consider it alongside the experience of the women and of the other disciples. In the encounter with their risen master, the disciples were renewed themselves. But even more importantly for history, they were able to infect others with this new life and joy which they had experienced. Renewal is, of course, a fact of daily existence. In the natural world, the season of spring heralds renewal. Trees begin to sprout leaves, the grass starts to grow again, and lambs begin to appear in the countryside. Humans, too, are influenced by the rhythms of nature, and springtime often brings us refreshment and a sense of new beginnings. All this is good and part of God's gracious purposes. But we are also spiritual beings and need spiritual renewal. Such a need for renewal is tied up with the sense of destiny which is an essential part of our nature and with the hope that we will be able to achieve our full potential. And yet we live in a world where our sense of destiny is often frustrated. We are disabled by circumstances, or enemies, or disease. We are unable to fulfill our potential, our relationships are soured, and we lose hope. Some observers of human behavior hold that religion has been invented solely to satisfy our longings for immortality. This is, of course, a grossly inadequate account of religion. There are many other aspects to it. There is some truth, however, in what the behaviorists say. It is remarkable that the human species alone should have a sense of persistence after death. How did such expectations emerge? Surely, they have to do with our sense of destiny and with the awareness that to a greater or lesser extent, we do not experience fulfillment in this life. If our moral life is to have a sound basis, and if the good is to be truly sovereign, we need assurance that justice denied now will not be justice denied forever. We know that we are ordinary and related to the rest of creation, but we also know that we are unique, moral and spiritual beings with a life and destiny beyond the merely physical and chemical. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead makes our spiritual aspirations authentic. It is a guarantee from God that injustice and oppression will not be able to eradicate justice and love, that death cannot overcome life, and that evil will not vanquish the good. It gives us hope for the future and renews our sense of personal and collective destiny. That is why Easter today continues to change men and women in the same way as the first Easter changed the disciples of Jesus. The risen Christ comes to sweeten our lives with his love and grace. As the 17th century poet George Herbert has said, I got me flowers to straw thy way, I got me boughs of many a tree, but thou wast up by break of day and brought thy sweets along with thee.
Let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. We thank you that you sent Augustine 1400 years ago to the shores of Kent. He sent us justice to found our cathedral and to light the flame of faith here. We thank you for the saints throughout the ages who have served and worshipped in this place. May we in our time, clergy and people, continue the spread of the Easter Gospel here. We pray for our Bishop Michael, for Bishop Brian, and for Jonathan, Bishop of our Link Diocese, Harare. We pray for those christened and confirmed here earlier today. We remember before you, O Lord, Elizabeth our Queen and all the members of the royal family. We pray for our Parliament, especially as the election approaches, that they will lead us to a just society. We pray for those involved in local leadership here in Rochester as our new unitary authority comes into being. for all the visitors who will come to the cathedral this year and we offer you our ministry of welcome to them. We pray for the many school children who will come here and offer you our ministry of education. in our prayers all in distress those in the Holy Land Albania and Northern Ireland and those in prison here in Rochester we remember especially the asylum seekers here that their cases may be resolved quickly we remember at this time of resurrection the housebound the lonely and the sad, and especially those older members of our congregation in care and nursing homes, remembering especially this morning Monica and Vera. May they this morning be rejoicing with us in the new life that you offer. Pray for the work of our local hospitals, St Bart's here in Rochester, All Saints and the Medway Hospitals, and the Wisdom Hospice. We think of those setting up the Children's Hospice here in Kent. keeping in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection those who have died especially Robert Arnold a former member of this cathedral whose anniversary it is this week rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all your saints we commend ourselves and all people to your unfailing love 
Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. To prepare ourselves to come to the altar of God on this great day, let us call to mind our own unworthiness and sin sinfulness. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. So may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us exchange a sign of the risen Lord's peace, which we share.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. It will become the cup of our salvation. Christ is risen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. Now we give you thanks because you raised him gloriously from the dead. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us eternal life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Through him accept our sacrifice of praise and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, having in remembrance his death once for all upon the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven, and looking for the coming of his kingdom, we make with this bread and this cup the memorial of Christ your Son, our Lord. He is risen indeed. Accept through him this offering of our duty and service, and as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, fill us with your grace and heavenly blessing. Nourish us with the body and blood of your Son, 
that we may grow into his likeness and made one by your spirit become a living temple to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, from all who stand before you in earth and heaven, now and forever. As our Savior has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. There we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Alleluia, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for me.
So from all of us here in Rochester this morning, go easy on those eggs, won't you? Happy Easter.